Have you ever wondered why we have so many different types of guitars? Parlors, jumbos, dreads, GAs. Today's show is all about the history of body shapes. Go there. <laughs> kind of blues jazz, jazz blues. Just throwing a bit of jazz from nowhere. <laughs> that's just, just take it over. That's, that's just how you Jazz Meister. Wow. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> hey, buddy. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Uh, how are we doing today, mate? Ah, well, it was just a bit of an interesting chat, which maybe turned into an episode, really. Could be. Got these books out after we started having a conversation about where guitars came from because we were sitting around and we were thinking well we have these shapes don't we we have this even though we have lots of different shapes you know and sizes and that's mm -hmm. to do with styles and to do with volume and projection and a whole bunch of stuff that we have imposed i guess over, over the last like century or so where does it actually come from where, where what's the history of like we've always had the same things there's there's a choice of different sizes you know there's parlors and OMs and dreads basically Mm. Few, few of the shapes around that. But when you look in the history of stringed instruments, there's dozens, if not hundreds, for our, in our world, they just kind of went, woof, this, yeah. is what, this is what they are. This is how many strings we're going to use. This is how many strings we're going to use. These are... This is the tuning. Several sizes, and I think by no means are we historians of musical instruments, but I think for where we are in our world, which is flat top steel strings, there was a long journey to a certain person that changed everything. Mm -hmm. And just like diving in, you know, there's, um, there's basically medieval stringed instruments, you know, 1300s, 1400s, 1500s, or 1340s, and there's up to the 1600s, and then there's... Because um, they're sort of lute-based lute, lute -based instruments, aren't they? Lute, and some of them with many strings. Many strings, double strings, you know, 90 degree headstocks, those really ornate sound halls. Mm -hmm. But basically there was like, in different parts of Europe, there was lots of stringed instrument development going on. You know, stringed instrument became very popular, different musical styles. In the, obviously, in the Baroque era, 1600s, 1750s, you know, there was lots of changes were going on. And in some some respects, you know, like guitar went one way for classical, and then it kind of developed in, in other parts of Europe into a different shape, which eventually moved around the world and became like the American guitar. Which, and that's and the that's, interesting that's thing. That's the isn't world it? we're in, really. Yeah. So there's lutes, there's uh, guitars, which were um, lute shaped, uh, Baroque style instruments, and then there's vojelas, in, which were coming through in Spain. Which are still kind of being used now in a mariachi. Still used in, band. in, ma in mariachi yeah. bands. But original vojelas. Or a version of it. Or a yeah. version of it. I think that word is very important in guitar making because vuela, which I think in, in Spain is pronounced uh, buela, but spelt with V mm -hmm. I H U E L A, vuela, mm -hmm. and you know, influenced sort of the, the term viola, or many people will, will write about that. And if you look at the early vuelas, or some vuelas coming through the 16 and 1700s, they were guitar shaped, yeah. they weren't lute shaped. And they weren't baroque style. They would very much looked like a skinny, yeah, kind of um, early odd shaped parlor type of thing. Mm -hmm. The kind of hourglass shape that we yeah. sort of know. And, and obviously, it's a Spanish word. And then it, you know, in Italy, other things were going on because vuela or viola de gambas, mm -hmm. you know, which are very early 15th century sort of 
instruments which are very much violin style, large sort of violin, violas, small cello style things. And Vuhelas, for me, in the little I know, that's the turning point. That's like the, the bit where something, several things came out of that bit of development. In Spain, somehow, you know, late, I think late 1700s, the Vuhel had become a six string. So all those double strings and 12 mm -hmm. strings and 10 strings had become less popular. And it became a six string instrument. And then comes along Mr. Torres. Yeah. And Torres took the Vuhela and just changed it, made it bigger, developed the fan brace. It became louder, mm -hmm. changed the waist, and the classical guitar was born. But essentially, Torres's design hasn't massively changed since that time, has it? I don't, I don't think classical guitars have really. You know, there's different bracing systems and there's all sorts of innovation in classical guitar building and double tops and double backs and double bodies and all that sort of stuff. But basically what Torres did was end some of that lineage there. It's like for hundreds of years, all these stringed instruments came along. Torres got it and it's like produced something that everybody loved, played music on it, the music developed and, it, and that, end, that, that was kind of frozen there. You mm -hmm. know, that lineage kind mm -hmm. of kind of uh, really cemented the instrument. So what's the history of <clears throat> C.F. Martin? Because he came from Europe and emigrated to America, sort of early 19th century, right? This is the interesting bit. So when Torres did that to the Vuhela, there's these other stuff going on in Italy and in Austria and Germany, because Viennese guitars and Baroque guitars and all that sort of stuff. But that nylon string, that classical guitar, I mean, everything was gut string back then anyway, which is an Whole weird thing. I know. <laughs> but in Spain, it, it, Torres kind of took it and made it into something, and then it m morphed into other things, like in, in Italy, and you had um, you know, builders that were continuing making instruments that you hold like this, and then they were making instruments you hold like this. Uh -huh. And Vuhelas, in my understanding, could be played by hand, or they could be played with a bow. And that led to many other instruments whether it was viola de gambas or whatever else. Were they vials? Playing, you, were, you were telling me before about people playing something with a kind of a, a fashioned quill. Yeah, so, so the like plectrums have been around for hundreds of years. But the way to pick it was sort of, it was between the fingers or something, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it, it was a pick, but it was, it, a pick. It was an early version yeah. of that, yeah. And, and, and also, you know, we're just talking about Europe here, there was like stringed instruments manufacturing, manufacturing, making going yeah. on everywhere, so it wasn't, you know, we, we tend to think like Torres, Stauffer, and then Martin and all that sort of stuff. But actually, there's ouds. There's all sorts of stuff that That's was right. being made in Asia. And they predate kind of written history or a lot yeah. of those things. Yeah. You know, so it's like... But that's an interesting thing. So Stauffer, Stauffer, he, he, he was the luthier that trained so, C.F. Martin. Correct. So Johann Stauffer, so he was in Vienna, and he'd learned from an um, a Italian... Luthier, who was moving down the, the guitar style path or that shaped, you know, playing an instrument like this way instead of that way. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of violin, viola development going on in Italy at the same time. But this, let's call it the early parlor shaped guitars, you know, with the, sort of very ornate sort of hook headstocks. That, and with, a, with, with the ma sort of the tuning pegs, though, the machine heads will be tuning pegs, we're, we're all in a sort of linear fashion. They were Correct. all in one. Line, and, and weren't they, they? You know, they had these long cutaway sort of fingerboards. Yeah. So where, the, where the trebles would be, would have, would have frets. But yeah. The, but the bass, the bass is cut away. So yeah. again, musical styles. So this is developing. This is, this is 1810s, 1820s. This time Torres kind of, was, you know, just before Torres kind of drew a line in the sand for the classical style guitar, Spanish guitar. Mm -hmm. You've still got lots of other development going on in, in uh, certainly in Europe, and you know, I'm not talking about the rest of the rest of the world. In Vienna, Germany, and Italy. Italy, obviously, many many violins, orchestral in instruments have their their, their lineage from mm. their heritage from there. But somehow, Stauffer learned in Italy, I believe, from Fibra, Giovanni Fibracore or somebody like that. Okay. Went back to Vienna. He was making these parlor style guitars, these style instruments. Yes. And then. One of his young apprentices changed the world forever when he left Stauffer's shop and he got on a boat, went to America. He was called Christian Frederick Martin 
and he landed in New York, set up in 1833, mm -hmm. and his first guitar was a Stauffer style Viennese parlor guitar, or yeah. whatever you want to call it. I think that came out in 1834. Changed everything forever. Mm -hmm. And, and what, whatever would have happened to us, or it's hard to say what would have happened. I'm sure we would have ended up with something like this, maybe. Him leaving Europe, going to America, and then the whole relationship between CF and American music drew many lines in the sand, but it was, all the guitar shapes were kind of were, were, were really reactions to musical yeah. styles and, and, and necessities of musicians. And, and volume, I think, as well, volume, isn't it? Massively around yeah. volume. Before before micing became a thing, probably before in Mike, 19... you know, all, and all that sort of <clears> stuff. 30s. <clears throat> so you've got all this st sort of stuff still going on in Europe, of which the Spanish classical guitar became very, very dominant. Yes. And then in America, you've got one guy, right, changed all of that, moved to um, New York, set mm -hmm. up, mm -hmm. built what he knew. You already learned to build, which mm -hmm. were these V&E style guitars. I don't know a great deal about this, and I, 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 I tremble going in because there's so many knowledgeable p people about Martin, but I know that CF built many, many shapes of what, let's call it a parlor guitar, his early styles, and there was, there was many, many versions of oh, that. Other versions of O's, like double O's and... It wasn't an O then. Ah. It was like style this or pattern number 25 or whatever it ah, was. Okay. He hadn't okay. got to the O yet in... Um, in 1854, he built the all. So that's like, you know, 20 years he'd been going all different shape parlors. And for some reason, he built the all, which isn't the same as this, but it's, the all is really, that's the American guitar. That's where, the, the, where our lineage, our steel string yeah. flat top really goes back to. Yeah. When he nailed that, and he built it. So parlor guitars are called parlor guitars. They were built for ladies predominantly because they were small because generally ladies in, in the parlor were entertaining after entertaining dinner. Entertaining guests and yeah. family members after mm -hmm. they're sitting down and politely somebody would play the parlor guitar in the parlor room. Mm -hmm. And the O CF called a concert guitar because all of a sudden now we've left the parlor mm -hmm. and the guitar was giving concerts because people were... And, and a larger shape to project. Correct. Yeah, So to an audience. So he didn't make a parlor guitar anymore, he made a concert guitar. Yeah. And the O was their concert model. Mm -hmm. It was bigger, deeper, louder, and it was to reach people who went to see guitar concerts, of which there was no microphone and PA system. Mm -hmm. So it was basically... And then as that became more popular, they reacted to that by building the grand concert Mm -hmm. which was the double O. Yes. The double O is very similar, just slightly bigger. And that was in, so we've got, we got the O in 1854, we've got the double O in 1873. And then I, I'm not sure if it was right at the end of the 1800s or beginning of 1900s, he built the triple O. The 12th, the tw so all these are 12th frets yes. for now. Yes. And then he built the triple O 12th fret, which was massive in comparison to anything that had ever been built. Yeah. It was huge and it didn't sell. Nobody wanted the triple O. The triple O's, 12 fret triple O's, in my reading, didn't sell for the first 20 something years. Fascinating. Until music changed. And then, ah, oh, but that's bigger and louder. And, it's, and, and that leads us really to the Ditson. Yeah. To the Dreadnought. I think we do have, we can point to a, a link, I think. Yeah. We so Sam can put a link up there. Yeah. But we did do a, a, a breakdown on the Dreadnought and where, you know, the Ditson story and the the Hawaiian steel string guitar and all yeah, that sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've got an O in 1854, we've got a double O in 1873, late 1800s, right at the beginning, I don't know if it's 1898 or something, or 1902 or something, is, is the triple O. And it stopped, that didn't work, so we've still got smaller guitars looking like this. And then the Dreadnought came along, and that didn't work either. Uh, uh, it was actually uh, several requests by a manager at one of the distance stores that got Martin making that. Yeah, because there was one guy who just kept pushing it, just kept, right? kept, kept pushing and asking for for the shape and, and the bins and try to get in the twenties and all that sort of stuff. But we we'll, we do a deep dive in that in our dreadnought show. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Okay, hold on, my memory. So it's something like where are we? We're early nineteen hundreds. Mm -hmm. The shape is dialed in. The parlor, the O is that's it. We're, that's for, for our flat top steel string world. Yeah. Well, we'll get the steel string in a second. That's dialed in. Grand concert. Triple O didn't work. Then in 1929, they came out with the OM. That did work. It was massively different because all of a sudden they'd gone to a 14th fret joint in the neck. So it wasn't 12th fret joint anymore. Tension. 
mm -hmm. longer scale, mm -hmm. driving the box a bit more. Mm -hmm. And then throughout that 20s, so, so earlier on in the 20s, there was the Dreadnought as well. The Ditson thing failed, Ditson went bankrupt. We won, we know all that story. And then <clears throat> Martin released um, the Dread, was it in 31? I think it was, yeah. I think. Yeah, I think it's it in our Dreadnought show. And, and this is something like, I don't know, but in 29, they released the OM, which stands for orchestral model. And in 34, I think, they came out. So there was the triple O 12 fret that didn't sell mm -hmm. in the early 1900s. And they came out with a triple O 14th fret. It did, but it was virtually the same as an OM. Yeah, in so fact, you have to wonder what's the, what was the thing behind that. In fact, they used the, exactly the same body. And there are obviously conversations about this online. And I still, so basically an OM and a triple O 14 fret are the same guitar, except the OM is slightly longer scale length and there's slightly different width of, of nut. And I guess maybe, please somebody tell me if I'm wrong here. I think whatever they kept from the original 12 fret triple O, mm -hmm. they brought some of that scale length and nut width into the What about the fret. body shape? Is the body shape? Today and from then, the body shape of a 14 fret triple O and mm -hmm. OM is exactly the same. Ah, for some reason I thought there was a lot, there was a longer... A triple O <clears> 12 fret is longer. So a triple O 12 fret is quite a sizable body mm -hmm. because it comes to the 12 fret, it's a mm -hmm. long body. Yes. The body of a triple O 12 fret is about the same length as a dreadnought. Small abouts, but it's mm -hmm. a very long guitar. Mm -hmm. And then instead of just, because they couldn't have just pulled that back for a 14 because it would have looked stunted, they developed this new body shape, which was the OM. And then a triple O, which is the same shape, a slightly different scale, and slightly different nut width. Maybe I can, somebody can enlighten us on on, on, on some of the thinking yeah, around yeah. that. And that's it. There we are. And then, so shape-wise, this, uh, the O is slightly smaller and a bit different. We we've settled on on this is our parlor shape, but it's you know it's we all go back to that O. Yeah. And then there was a double O, a triple O, an OM, a dread, an OM, triple O, fourteen. It was other people doing things. Mr. Gibson was doing things, mm -hmm. you know, and he had his um, old shapes. And because Orville Gibson, <clears throat> that was more like an arch top kind of design that he came up with in the early 20th century, right? So there's lots of arch top <clears throat> stuff going on, <clears throat> you know, that, no doubt. But I think looking at flat top design is, is where we're, we're yeah. at. Yeah. But I think what's really funny or uh, uh, interesting is like, and it's probably the same in many product de design arenas is, mm -hmm. That development, Torres perfected something. Uh, Torres made something that everybody liked, mm -hmm. and it didn't morph anymore. That's right. So the the, the hundreds of years to Torres, I know. which was so many different types of instruments in so many tunings and That's so right. many this and, and that. And for the last 200, 250 years, it's yeah. pretty much just it's just stopped. Yeah. And then the same like on the other side of Europe, you've got. You know the Viennese stuff coming through, and, and what CF did, and then yes, he 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 answered what the musicians needed with regard yeah. to volume well, and size. That's, that's it, isn't it? He developed the X, so that was something as well. But once we got what we what we loved and what we liked, and it's the same as like the aesthetics. So many things have changed. You know, like in those early Baroque instruments, when they wanted, you know, they 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 wanted to add more. Some had frets, some didn't. Like viola da gambas have some frets and then some. Not, That's right. Don't have had a, so maybe, I don't know, maybe but like, to like what you know, would they, be our they, fifth they, fret or something. They, the headstocks would come this way, but which you could get longer, more tension, long, more strings. So, so like you could have 12, 16, whatever. Something, some of them look like they have 30 strings, That's but the right. headstock comes this way because they didn't want to make it so long. Because you, but we ended up with these long instruments, you know, where you can get tension in other ways. And again, some of these parlors, they're so weird to our eye anyway, to the modern eye. Even some of CF's parlors, you know, they just don't look right. Mm -hmm. But eventually, when he made the O, the world thought, ah, we like that. Yes. And it sounds, it's loud, and we love the shape. And then, apart from the other shapes, development kind of... But there's a whole other conversation that spins off from here, isn't there? About, you know, musical styles. When we got to the blues, and, you know, I guess those early guys were using parlor shapes anyway, weren't they? Robert yeah. Johnson. You know. mm -hmm. Then a whole genre of music kind of... is kept in that yeah. sound because of that, those instruments were available then. Yeah. And the same with Dreadnought. And the development of the guitar from there mm -hmm. 
whether it, were, it was a large body guitar, whether it was a, you know, a, a, a cutaway. It's volume really demanded, the volume it affected the design and different styles of music. Yeah. But when you look at the, at the, the journey to where we are today, there was all, all of this massive sort of, you know, now we've got, you know, obviously people who play Baroque style music are using Baroque style instruments. Sure. And it's kept there and it's kind of in a vacuum. That's where it is. Mm -hmm. People who play blues music generally play parlor guitars or small body guitars. Then you've got very um, versatile things like the, the OMs and triple O's and stuff. But it's, even like a Strat, like Leo comes out like, oh, there you go, it does everything. Perfectly comfortable, looks amazing. It's got all these contours and, and you've got like endless amounts of like positions and, and where, that's it. It's kind of, I think when you get something so right. Yeah. This, he probably didn't develop this. When it once CF made the O because all of a sudden the sales grew, people loved it. So yeah. why did he need to keep developing stuff? He needed to make stuff to meet demand. Then we've got- That's about tweaking, fine tuning. Fine tuning after that. Yeah. More resonance, more volume, more sustain. Or, yeah. yeah. And, then, and then I would say, if we come right now you know, to the 60s, 70s, 80s, I think most guitar sales were dreadnoughts. Some OMs and maybe some triple O's, but mainly. Yeah. Then you come round into the 2000s, you know, like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, all of a sudden parlors became popular again. Mm -hmm. Like when I first started playing guitar, nobody played a parlor. Yeah. And then they became cool, hip, like everyone wanted a parlor. And I think because volume didn't, volume's not as important now, mm -hmm. because we have pickups, we have little lamps, we have DIs, we have mixes, recordings like really refined. In the early days, people just sat in a concert hall with nothing and played guitar. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna build all of our shapes with exactly the same configurations. This is brilliant. Right. Tell everybody what we're gonna do. So we're gonna build everything from a parlor to a, a, you know OMs, double Os, triple Os, dreads round and square shouldered, baritones, yes. jumbo, etc. We're gonna make them exactly the same. Same tops. Same woods. Same backs and sides. Yeah. And we'll do a deep dive. Why mechanically they sound the way they do, not just style, but why sonically those shapes impact the tone and that would be a bigger episode but mm -hmm. that got us talking about this and that's right anyway okay guys hope that w ramble was all right and uh <laughs> we'll certainly get do more stuff on shapes anyway and we'll uh, we'll see you next time great stuff thanks Thank a lot bye, bye bye thanks for watching if you enjoyed this video click the like button and consider subscribing to our channel if you want to watch more videos like this one click the video on the screen now